per year. And they went from, do you know what their, their major export was? It was human hair for making wigs. Now they're the home of Samsung, one of the biggest technology juggernauts. So they did this by, by watching what America did before 1980. And they did that. And, they, and they've turned their whole country around. Some other things we can do, of course, is um, invest in infrastructure projects and green energy technology, which part of the stimulus with that was that, just not enough of it. I mean, if we're going to... If we're going to spend borrowed money, we should at least get something tangible. Let's, let's rebuild our roads, you know, our schools, our water systems, all these things that are collapsing. And those are good jobs that have to stay here. Um, and of course, investing in green energy, I like this one, um, you know, whether you believe in climate change or not, <laughs> it's like, um, you know, it's good for the environment and how, and it, it gets our independence from foreign oil, and I also believe it's the next great thing, like the internet, that will surge the economy. So instead of buying shoes made in China or more toys, you know, I'd love it if solar panels were less than twelve thousand dollars. You know, if they were about five thousand dollars, I'll go out and buy some solar panels and put them. On. <laughs> I mean, I've heard that you can get your meter to actually go backwards and sell energy back to TEP. That sounds really cool. I mean, I think it's something people could get excited about. Um, and then, of course, we need to close the wealth gap, as we talked at length. And this chart shows how, when the tax policies were more fair, you see how we all grew together from 1947 to 1979? And then what happened after 1980 is we all grew apart. So this shows, like, the bottom 20%, second 20%, all the way up to the top 5%. And I wish this chart had the top 1%, because I bet you that would be off the chart. Um, so, uh, so what's been happening is, let's see, since 19, okay, so, the, so right now we have the stock market soaring again, Wall Street bonuses are at record highs, private industry is hoarding nearly $2 trillion in cash. They really don't need a tax cut. They're sitting on a lot of cash. Meanwhile, the rest of us are struggling with flat wages, job insecurity, and rising costs for housing, health care, and education. You know, it's not just taxes that take money out of your pocket. <laughs> when you're healthy, when you, so say you get $400 back on your taxes. If your health care costs went up $1,200, you're not doing as well. If your Comcast bill went up, you know, $200 for the year, or your energy went up $500. At the end of the day, what matters is what's in your pocket. And it really doesn't matter who's taking it out of your pocket. You want to figure out policies that leaves the most money in your pocket at the end of the day. Um, so there you go. The super rich are getting the fat by eating the rest of us for lunch. There's your class warfare for you. <laughs> so let's return to taxes that work for everyone. And here, I love this graph because it shows what we were having the discussion about last month. So here in column one is what the Democrats were proposing. And those little circles are kind of proportional to the tax cut. These were extending the Bush tax cuts in red, just extending them as they were. And this was the Obama GOP compromise that actually passed. What the Democrats, what the big fight was about was getting rid of these giant goose eggs over here. You can see that the Democrats wanted to pass pretty similar, all the way up to almost $500,000. You know, sometimes it was a little higher over here for these people. But all the way up to $500,000, those little balls were about the same amount of tax cuts. The idea of we're not giving the, keep giving these tax cuts to these people over here. This is what's gotten us in the big problem with the wealth gap that's expanding and then our huge deficits. So just this right here for two years adds $150 billion to the deficit. For what? It's not going to create any jobs. I mean, you just heard on the news that, oh, all of a sudden business is good at Tiffany's again. Great. How is that <laughs> benefiting the rest of us, right? People who work for Tiffany's will have more jobs. <laughs> exactly. Wow. Exactly. Now, here's a little mnemonic device I came up. I don't know if it's mnemonic or just a little, a little cheat to figure out. Whenever you hear the word, when you hear $1 billion was just spent, or we had, this is going to add $1 billion to the deficit, think of it as if you're a taxpayer, that costs $7. That just cost me seven dollars. So a hundred billion dollars, think dollars. When you hear a trillion dollars, then you think to yourself, that just cost me seven thousand dollars. Was it worth it? So it's kind of a little way just to relate it to yourself. So those, so one hundred and fifty billion dollars. Hundred. That's well, per annum. Seven thousand per annum. Per year. Yeah. If it, if somebody says like this program is going to cost a hundred billion dollars for this year, right? You hear that? Then you go. 
Okay, that's $700 billion for me. So that's an average if you take 150 million taxpayers, right? Because not all 300 million of us pay taxes, so I'm just taking it. So it's kind of a neat little way to relate everything to yourself in terms of, well, you know, kind of like you're getting your checkbook out and going, was that worth it? So when we talk about that these two wars have cost us over a trillion dollars, think about it as a taxpayer, well, that was that worth $7,000 from me, right? And if But I think his question was, are oh, we taking per year? Is it 7000 per year? Yeah, if the policy is saying, uh, yeah, right. So, so for example, this was $150 billion to the deficit over two years. So, so you have to go... Uh, right, so we would multiply that by seven dollars, which is about a thousand, a thousand dollars or so for two years. So that just cost me five hundred dollars for those rich people <laughs> to get a tax cut, right? So that's kind of a neat way to think about it. Could you repeat that point again? I've, oh. I've just completely lost on what okay. you're talking about. So you know, you just hear all these huge numbers thrown around. Like, like that policy, that's good. We can't afford that because extending unemployment is going to cost fifty billion dollars to do that for one year. Right? Or, you know, those tax cuts are going to cost $400 billion. So I was trying to figure out a way to relate it to myself because I don't know what a billion dollars is or a hundred billion. It's all crazy money, right? So, here, so here's the way to think about it. Every time you hear a billion, say it's for a year, so a billion, whatever the time frame is, think that just cost me seven dollars for that. Year. Where do you get the seven dollars from? I don't understand the Because I took a hundred and fifty there's hundred and fifty million taxpayers in this country. Okay. We have three hundred million people, but about only hundred and fifty million pay taxes. So if you divide a billion, which is a thousand million, mm -hmm. right? Okay. One billion, by hundred and fifty million you get about seven dollars. Okay. Trying to make it easy. So That's just remember the, the, the number seven, right? For a billion. Mm -hmm. And when you hear trillion Right, because one trillion is a thousand billion. Just multiply that seven by a thousand. Again, I think it's kind of a neat way to relate every policy <laughs> to how much is this cost, <laughs> and then get your checkbook out. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, another thing we can, of course, do is invest in education. That would be a worthwhile way of, of spend if we're going to deficit spend, because right now we have a record high school dropouts. Colleges are com being com completely unaffordable and out of reach. People are just uh, getting out of school with so much debt. It's I, just, I just can't believe it. I mean, I was in school in the mid-80s, and, and this is insane what kids are graduating with now. Um, so instead of tax cuts for the rich, you know, those big goose eggs we saw, if we're going to deficit spend, how about hiring lots more teachers? You know, those are good middle-class jobs, and those people will go out and spend money. <laughs> okay, great demand. We could also subsidize college education, and how about free retraining for laid off workers for new green energy jobs? Okay, um, and next of course, make unionizing easier. Okay, and as my husband back there who's been 40 years, just retired as he said, 40 years with the phone company, and 40 years with Communication Workers of America Union, if you're a worker bee, unions are your friend. I, you know, don't let anyone tell you otherwise. <laughs> and if you want to ask a real union worker, just go over there and ask Elvin mm -hmm. how much a union does for you. And it's worth every penny of the piddly dues you can pay. So when the middle class was strongest, um, before after World War II in the 40s and 50s, you can see here that 35% of the workforce was unionized. Almost a third of the workforce was unionized. That was back when my husband grew up. His dad was a union worker in the, in the Midwest. How many kids are in your family? You had eight brothers and sisters? Yeah. So one income, right, could afford to pay for nine kids, a mortgage. I think your dad had to stop for food every day on the way home, though, didn't he? <laughs> he could afford the grocery, just couldn't keep them in the house. Okay. So now look what's happened. Is after all the union busting and bashing, we're down to about 12% of the workforce is unionized. Um, so is it any wonder? Is it any wonder that workers have crappy wages and no power? I mean, if you're a worker bee, your power comes from the power of the group. I mean, how many of us can go to our boss and say, hey, I don't think you're treating me right. I think I need a raise. What do you mean you're, you're taking away my health care or cutting my health care benefits, right? We're all so scared, we're just happy to have a job that we put up with everything. So it's the group that gets you the power. So, uh, so when you hear claims that unions are the source of our problem, it just doesn't fit with the facts. Unions at its all-time low, so how could that be the cause of our problems? Maybe it's the opposite. In my view, it's just another manipulation to get all of us ants to fight over the crumbs so we don't see the, the super rich making off with the whole pie. And that's what it's all about. It's just an idea of distraction. Mm -hmm.